it's now recording the session. <laughs> Great, thanks, Clara. And yes, you should have been notified when you signed up um, that we will be recording the session so that we are able to um, share it afterwards with people who weren't able to attend. Fortunately, we haven't missed too much. So, um, so we're just going to tell you a little bit about the background to the Bristol Community Climate Action Project. So it kicked off um, in 2020 with a kind of phase one pilot project. And here we've got uh, some of the kind of main aims of the project. So focusing on taking action, not just on climate and nature, but also on inequality, really trying to develop community led um, leadership on climate. Um, and doing this through the co-creation of community-led climate action plans um, and underpinned by a co-production process, so working with, by and before communities as a way of developing those plans. And as I mentioned really kindly, this whole programme is supported by the Lottery's Climate Action Fund. So who's been involved so far? Um, to date, we've been working with six fantastic community partners in the city. So four of those are Geographic, Ambition Lawrence Western, Eastside Community Trust, Lockley's Neighbourhood Trust and Heart BS13, and two demographic communities, Bristol Disability Equalities Forum and ACH, who are working with the refugee and migrant community. The project is coordinated by Bristol Green Capital Partnership and we've got strategic support from Bristol City Council and from CSE. And I'm going to stop sharing there because I'd like to take this opportunity for each of our lovely existing community partners to just very, very briefly introduce themselves. So if I am going to ask Kirsty if she wouldn't mind kicking off and then if you can just pass the baton on to the next person, we'll just do a quick round robin so that anyone who's joining us in the audience just just knows the face and um, and who they might be asking questions of later in the Q&A session. Over to you, Kirsty. Hi, I'm Kirsty Hammond from Heart of BS13. I'm their Climate Action Programme Manager. And before the start of this project, I was a community development worker. So it shows that you can change from doing community development into climate and segues quite nicely. I'll pass you on to Donna. Thanks, Christy. So I'm Donna from Ambition Lawrence Western, um, and I manage the Community Climate Action Project. And we're based in the very north of the city in Lawrence Western. Uh, Maria? Good morning, I'm Maria. I'm the Community Activator for Lockley's East Neighbourhood Trust. I'm one of the leads on our project, which is really wild, uh, rewilding Lockley's with flowers and trees. And community engagement and true resident-led action is all part of community development. And I don't know who else was here. Sorry, Amy. Somebody waved to me. That's okay. Should we hand over to Emily? Ah, Emily. Good morning, everybody. I'm Emily Byfield um, from Eastside Community Trust, the Community Climate Action Project lead here, and we are based in Easton and Lawrence Hill. And our project now is focused on building resilience in our local area through energy and local leadership around climate. Um, Emma, would you like to take, take it next? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Emma from the Bristol Disability Equality Forum, um, and I'm the climate lead and interim manager. I can't, who's here from ACH, Amy? Um, we, we've got Daisy and we need to be kind to Daisy because she's very new on the project. So do you want to just quickly introduce yourself, Daisy? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Amy. Um, I'm Daisy. I just joined um, Ashley Community Housing this week. Um, so I'm currently on day number three, um, but I will be leading our contribution um, to the programme. Um, and I've joined as a research and projects manager. So looking forward to, to getting to know you all and working with you very closely. Thank you. Great, thanks Daisy. Um, and then Mark? Hello, yes, Mark Leach uh, from Bristol City Council. I work in the climate team and I've been working with the CCA project since right from the very beginning. And I'll hand over to Harriet. Hi everyone, I am Harriet and I'm in the communities team at the Centre for Sustainable Energy and we are one of the partners in the project, kind of working with the community partners on looking at their carbon footprints and then trying to capture some of the carbon savings of the activities that they're doing going forward. Um, yeah, and we've been involved in the project from the beginning, which has been a real privilege. Uh, pass back to Amy. 
Thanks, Harriet. I'm just um, my colleague, Clara, who's going to be manning the chat and doing some tech support today. But uh, do you just want to introduce yourself, Clara, too? Oh, thanks, Amy. Um, Clara, project coordinator at Bristol Green Capital Partnership. Great. Thanks, everyone. So those faces will be familiar. So get your get ready with your questions that uh, you'd like to, to ask them. And we'll be hearing from a couple of the, the partners throughout the course of this session. Right, I'm back on the slide. It's uh, we were just saying this morning, Clara and I, that after we've now got back into the groove of doing quite a lot of in-person sessions, so it now feels like we're a little bit rusty at running um, Zoom events when they were like so the norm for years. So uh, apologies in advance if, uh, if we're not uber slick with anything this morning. Um, so now I'd just like to give you a really quick sort of snapshot of the wider project that the Learning and Mentoring Programme sits within. So as I said, we have been funded up until 2025 for a kind of second phase and expansion of the Community Climate Action Project. And there's just a super quick overview here of um, what that consists of. So each of the partners that you've just heard from is uh, delivering their own demonstrator project focused on a particular climate theme. We've also uh, doing some citywide work around transport, the thorny issue of transport, developing um, a community vision, a toolkit, and there'll be a new uh, champion for Bristol's community of disabled people working in transport. We are in the early stages of the developing a new community leadership panel on climate and just transition for the city. Um, and that's actually something that sort of graduates or alumni from the learning and mentoring programme will have the opportunity uh, to feed into and to join. And then we've got obviously what we're talking about today, the learning and mentoring programme, which aims to support um, and inspire 12 further communities. So six in 2023 and then a further six in 2024 um, co-create community plan action plans and then we've got a strand of work which is all around sort of creative comms so we've got some artist commissions lots of regular events and comms campaigns all trying to engage more and more diverse people in the climate conversation so just to touch a little bit more on what we're specifically here to um, to chat to you about this morning, the learning and mentoring program for the new cohort um, of six organisations in 2023. So this is this is totally new, and it yeah it's focused on encouraging and supporting more and more diverse community organisations in the development of their own community climate action plans. There's a £3,000 bursary to support those organisations participating in the programme. Um, and it will take the form of a series of free monthly workshops with different climate experts and also peer mentoring and support from uh, community climate experts that have been honing their skills and their insights over the first phase of the project. And also lots of uh, resources and links um, to support new communities on their journey around climate and nature action. So just to say a little bit more about this, this idea of creating a, um, a community climate action plan. So this very much underpins the learning and mentoring program. And that's the output at the end that we will be supporting new communities to develop. Um, but what is it and, and how do you go about developing one? So reflecting on the first phase of the project, we just sort of put together a little bit of an overview of what that sort of process is to, um, to develop one. So there's, there's an element of working at the beginning, depending on where your starting point is, around developing your confidence and knowledge around climate and nature issues. Um, and also sort of getting to grips with the sort of climate ecosystem and strategy within the city. Having a baseline, so generating a carbon footprint for your specific community. And then starting to work with other organisations within your community, decision makers and climate experts in the city. Through um, uh, engagement activities, trying to sort of create, collect a bit of a snapshot of what your community's current priorities are. And that's both the sort of social um, and climate, because there's a real focus on this project of not just doing climate and nature on its own, but that intersection um, with improving people's quality of life at the same time. And those two things aren't mutually exclusive. They're very much intertwined. And that's very much a core part of the project. Um, so then 
going out and doing some inclusive and accessible engagement with your community uh, to delve a bit deeper into what those priorities are and what people are feeling about climate and social issues. And from that, trying to hone it down to create some very specific priorities across seven climate themes um, that really encapsulate the insights that you've collected through the engagement process. Making sure that you're kind of like sharing those priorities with local partners and climate experts to help refine them, make sure they sit alongside well with other strategic um, plans and priorities for the city or challenge them perhaps. Um, and then use those priorities to form the basis of the Community Climate Action Plan document. So that also is going to include wider information on your specific community, like maybe climate heroes that you've got in your community. And then once you've got the Community Climate Action Plan, um, sharing that widely and using it as an advocacy tool um, to begin the process of trying to implement the priorities that you've identified. So yeah, that's a bit of a snapshot of the, of the process of developing a community plan action plan. And obviously um, it's not linear, it comes in, you know, do that in many different ways and forms. And I think it's really important to mention at this point that the learning and mentoring program is not specifically for community organizations that have experience of or are working specifically within the climate and nature sector. Um, and we know uh, that climate action, nature action sort of manifests in many, many different forms and it's happening and it's happening now in every community across the city, but it's not necessarily, you know, that what's going on is not labelled as climate or nature action. We've got a lovely photo there of Nobby um, who runs the Men in Sheds in Lawrence Weston uh, and they run a repair cafe. Um, so that's, you know, the kind of example of, of what's going on um, in communities around the city and that these kinds of things that are happening have got those community benefits as well it's not just about climate health well-being reducing social isolation responding to energy pov poverty challenges um, reducing food waste and food poverty and it yeah it can just show up in many different forms and there's probably this kind of activity happening in your community to to some extent um, so energy surgeries, as we said, Nobby's kind of men and sheds, repair cafes, allotment groups, uniform swaps, um, tree planting, walking and cycling groups, community feasts with surplus food, all of that kind of thing. But uh, that is all climate um, action. So it's, it's not a specific thing. Uh, it's not a specific technical thing. It is something that a lot of us are doing in our day-to-day -day lives and within our community already. So it's about kind of harnessing that and celebrating it. And before we talk in a little bit more detail about the learning and mentoring programme, we thought it'd be useful to just um, share with you over the last two years what we've kind of gleaned, what we think the advantages are to communities of developing a community climate action plan. It's kind of like, you know, why bother? Why would you want to do this? So a few reflections from me and then from some of our community partners as well. So there's a real opportunity um, to unite your community around a positive vision for the future. We know, you know, we're in very challenging times um, and, you know, it, and it's quite hard to be uh, thinking about positive change, but there's, there's an opportunity to do this and then begin to think about the route map of how you can implement that vision. So uh, it, it can be a real opportunity to do that. For you as an organisation, um, it could be a real opportunity to raise your profile. It could open the door to new funding and new strategic partnerships in the city. We know that the majority um, of kind of trust and foundations and, and other sort of more philanthropic funders are um, very much now making climate a mainstream priority of all of their funds. So having a climate action plan can be really, really useful in kind of demonstrating that. It can really make sure around that sort of community leadership elements, really developing different community organisations as respected climate leaders in the city. And the benefit of that is it helps over time to ensure that a, a more diverse range of views from different citizens are helping to inform the city's strategic climate conversations and planning, which is really, really important. Um, thinking about resilience and adaptation and those kinds of things. We need to make sure that those guiding climate 
decision making in the city are representative of all of our city's communities so that those strategies can be fit for purpose. Um, and I've just got a couple of quotes here from a, a few of our community partners that when they were reflecting on um, what they feel were advantages to them that have come about through doing this work and um, creating community plan action plans. So I'll just give you a second to uh, absorb those. And then now, are you... Don't take my word for it. I'd like to uh, introduce one of our community partners to share a little bit about why they feel that community-led climate action is important. I'm going to hand over to Kirsty from Heart of BS13, who's going to do a little bit of an intro, and then we're going to show a film that they made as part of their plan. Over to you, Kirsty. You just need to unmute, Kirsty. <laughs> There we go. Hi everyone, I'm Kirsty. I won't take up too much of your time because I've got a really nice film that I want to show. Um, but I just wanted to say that when we started this, you know, I was not a climate expert. Um, climate change in itself, we have like the lowest concern in Bristol in BS13 um, based on the quality of life survey. So our baseline was very, very low and we had to really start from the ground up. Um, and so that's why you'll see in the video, um, we took a thematic arts approach. So what was nice about doing the community led climate action was that you could tailor that to your communities. And so for us, we knew, we knew that we had quite a, quite a hard challenge um, to be able to uh, bring the community on board and to, to learn about this. And that's why we focused on young people. Um, and we did this through using thematic arts. So we commissioned seven artists to work along all of the different schools. And that's how we produced our community climate led plan. And I would say that now that we have that, it's really built on the foundations of everything that we are doing here at Heart of BS13. And it's woven into every aspect of the business plan. And from, from just like that little idea of what we could do to what we're achieving now is, it's been a phenomenal journey and um, I'll let you see the video so that you can, yeah, don't just take my word for it. <laughs> okay. You get a play it, Amy? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me know if you can't hear sound. Something amazing has been happening in BS13 and I want to tell you about it. Over a thousand young people have been on a journey. We've been getting our heads around the climate and ecological emergency, climate emergency. Climate emergency. Climate emergency. and what that means and how it affects us all because if we don't know about it we can't do anything. BS13 is our home, it's ours. Sometimes it can be tough here to make ends meet, to find work when opportunities are rare, we get that the planet and nature are in crisis, but like my nan says, it's hard to put it first when there's bills to pay, mouths to feed, and it's a it's struggle, 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 struggle to keep going. Our carbon footprint is lower than in other parts of Bristol. If you don't fly every year and you don't buy loads of new stuff, it's going to be. But you can bet that with us managing with less and putting up with more, that we'll be the ones hit the hardest in the future. And it doesn't have to be like that. At the start of the Climate Action Project, we wondered, what can we do? We learnt and we shared, and knowledge is power, especially in our hands, because we are the future. We worked with creative people, we beatboxed, recycled rubbish into art, we invented new things to protect our planet from overheating. We learnt everything we do creates carbon, and that makes the planet hotter, which is a big problem and we need to find new ways, and that means buying and using less, taking care of what we have, looking after our environment, because without it, nature won't survive, and neither will we. I wish I'd been taught all about this when I was little. We need to make sure that children can understand it all from now on. 
then low carbon careers like solar panel engineers and climatologists will be open to us as well. My teacher said that 65% of new green jobs don't exist. There is a whole new green economy on its way and we want to be part of it. But we need investments and green businesses to come here so we can do those green jobs. How am I meant to get to college to get a good job when I can't get across town to be there? You can spend your life at the bus stop here. Buses get cancelled and when they do come they cost a fortune and the journeys take forever. I'll do my bit, but it's not all down to me. We need clean, accessible and efficient transport and not be forgotten about on the edge of the city. People are panicking about how much gas and electric is going up and how they can't afford to top up their key meter. Dad says we can't, we can't afford, afford to be green. Afford to be green. We've learnt about how if homes are built with clean, affordable, renewable energy, we save money and the planet. But our house is cold. There's not enough insulation. We'd love solar panels and ground source heating. Even if we had the money, it's not our house. There's no fresh bakery here. One butcher's and one veg shop, and that's miles from where I live. When we go shopping, our choice is expensive at the corner shop or a long walk to the supermarket and back with heavy bags. No wonder there's always trolleys dumped in the streets. Everything's wrapped in plastic, which means microplastics find their way into the earth, the air, the streams and the oceans. We want to talk to the supermarkets. It's about corporates making big changes too. We learnt about growing local food and how recycling that food waste into nutritious compost means we can start the growing process again. It goes, it goes round, round in a loop. Round in loop. Round in loop. I want to buy local food at a reasonable price. Better food, longer shelf life, less air miles, less waste. It would be healthier for us and the planet. Understanding how this is all linked has been our journey so far, and it's only the beginning. Everything's linked. Everything's, Everything's linked. linked. Everything. We need to act now. We know the part we can play and we need others to play their part too. Together we can bring about the change we need for BS13, for future generations and the planet. our community climate action plans but in order for it to be accessible to everyone we felt like doing a short summary video was really key and um so yeah I hope you all enjoyed it and it's there to share um if you're trying to explain what you're trying to do that this is the out this is one of the outcomes I'll put the link in the chat it's on our website um, it's on YouTube um but yeah and Tori was a is in the chat Tori was a local um, a local lady uh, who took part in one of the sessions that we were running, a local young person um, who was in the film. Anyway, great. Here we go. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kirsty, and uh, yeah, and the young people are part of BS13. Um, so that's as well as developing the plan itself, using those really effective comms tools to, to help um, connect and influence really, really important as well. So thank you. And we'll be hearing from some other community partners in a little while. Let's just get the... screen back up. Okay, so we're now going to jump in to talk a little bit more detail about uh, the, the learning and mentoring programme itself, um, because hopefully some of you in the audience are thinking about applying um, and would like to get a little bit more information. So the programme itself um, is, will take the form of seven monthly workshop sessions, and they're all going to 
be a bit of a deep dive into the seven climate themes that are represented within the Community Climate Action Plan sort of template that we've developed. So focus on energy and buildings, food, nature, transport, waste and resources, and then sort of like jobs, economy and education. So we'll be bringing in experts that we've worked with over the last couple of years and also be hearing from community partners on how they went about developing priorities on these different themes. So the dates and the times for those workshops are already scheduled for the whole year. Um, so they're Wednesday morning sessions and they're running from April to November with not one in August. So just a flag of that, the, the specific dates and times are in the application pack on the website. So it's also um, that those sessions also going to involve sharing of lots of resources to help you develop your community climate action plan specifically around each of those different themes. There's also going to be one-to-one one -to -one mentoring sessions with the phase one community partners who have obviously developed a real expertise in this. And that can be during the sessions or towards the end when um, you're thinking about developing your plan in detail. Bristol Green Capital Partnership would also support with a joint launch and celebration event for those new plans. So that would be in sort of like around about this time next year. Um, and that's to make sure that there's good comms and exposure to the new plans and the priorities coming from the new communities. That's really, really important. Um, we can help facilitate access to really broad networks within the climate and nature uh, sectors and pro bono support. So we will have experts obviously coming into those uh, seven workshop sessions, but there might be more detailed work that you want to do with your organization or with your wider community. We're fortunate with Bristol Green Capital Partnership, we've got over a thousand members um, working in, in all different sectors. And some of those are happy to, you know, really keen to be supporting communities in developing of those plans. So we can help do a bit of matchmaking so that you can get support in between the sessions. So yeah, you'll have the, the full support of the, the kind of the wider project team. So Bristol Green Capital Partnership, Bristol City Council and the Centre for Sustainable Energy sort of supporting particularly um, thinking about carbon monitoring and carbon footprints and those kinds of things, which is obviously one of CSE's particular um, specialisms. Um, and then obviously we're going to be, we'll be creating an online um, channel so that all of the partners from cohort two and all of the kind of core project partners and the uh, wave one community partners can have sort of exchange and dialogue, sharing of opportunities, um, opportunities for funding and that kind of thing in between sessions as well. So who's this opportunity for? Um, it is for Bristol-based community organisations. So Bristol City Council is a core partner of the project. And so it does need to be for um, supporting communities within the Bristol City Council boundaries. There's a little bit of flexibility on that. So if, for example, your actual organisation headquarters or um, community centre or something like that was based you know just outside but the majority of your community and the people that you worked with were actually within the Bristol city boundary um, then that would be okay. Um, it's open to all sizes and different types of organisations so there's real uh, diversity within the sort of like the size and scale of community partners that took part in wave one from sort of really small organizations that have only got a couple of staff up to you know much bigger ones that have got sites and offices and activity happening in several cities not just in Bristol so and it can be all types of community organization um, so it might be you know, uh, actually a festival or uh, a sports organization or a youth-led organization um, there's no predetermined idea of you know what constitutes community organization could be um, any type at all you don't have to have any um, experience of, of doing climate or nature focused activity. Um, obviously, you know, it would be great to hear about it if you have, but that's not a requirement at all. So we'll be designing the programme, as you heard from Kirsty, you know, um, it, it wasn't a specialism for, for quite a lot of our the community partners from the beginning. Um, and, and, you know, arguably that's most uh, impactful. So you don't need to worry about that. It's not for organisations that are already working in those sectors. 
it's ideally we're going to be prioritizing community organizations that are based in or serving communities that aren't currently represented so that's geographic areas or demographic communities because over time we obviously want to expand um, the reach geographically and also the the diversity of the types um, of demographic communities that are involved in the project and helping to shape and influence climate decision making in the city um, underpinning sort of something that some of our funding criteria is that a prioritization around communities experiencing social or economic disadvantage or barriers um, and something that's really important and we will we ask about on the application form is that no matter what type of organization you are you really are embedded within a specific community whether that's a community of geography um, uh, or demography and that you feel that you you genuinely authentically have the ability to um, represent the views and needs of that community so that you're doing you know you've got an ongoing relationship and engagement that comes with that community so that you are able to represent them there's some basic sort of like organizational requirements um, that you need to be a not-for-profit organization. You have to have a, a kind of constituted organization, so some form of management board or um, trustees. You need to have your own or bank account and, and a sort of formal constitution. So that's really important. And it's our aim for cohort two to be the same as the, the first one in the world. Ideally, we're looking for four organizations that are representing new geographic communities in the city and two organizations representing new demographic communities in the city. Um, so just to say a little bit more then about the bursary um, that we can offer to sort of support community organisations from getting involved. So with the, again, I'd like to say thank you to the Lotteries Climate Action Fund for you know, supporting this. Um, they're enabling this to happen. And we know that it's not possible for community organisations really to commit to new priorities or activities without resource or additional capacity. Um, so to help support community organisations participate in the learning and mentoring programme, we're offering this bursary. Um, and so there's £3,000 per community organisation, and part of that is to support staff time um, and engagement necessary for the development of community climate action plans. It's really, um, the sort of bursary aims to boost community organisations who are interested in getting involved in doing climate and nature related work and, and, and committed to doing that, um, but that money might be a bit of a barrier. And it's so critical that, that, you know, that there is some paid staff time or sort of backfilling staff time to enable um, staff or, or maybe volunteers to attend the sessions. Because, I mean, it's great, isn't it, having a... Uh, a, a kind of a learning and mentoring program offer but if you you, you know you actually need the capacity the paid capacity to be able to participate in it um so that the three thousand pound bursary we've just sort of split it up into some different chunks to cover the different stages of the project um, and really the bursary aims to pump prime community organizations uh, with the foundations of, of developing a community climate action plan um, however we are encouraging participating organisations to also perhaps utilise other match funding, volunteering time or capacity, maybe pro bono climate expert time, et cetera, um, to help lever further capacity and budget to support wider and deeper development um, of the development of the community climate action plan. And Bristol Green Capital Partnership is committed to um, supporting this in, uh, in various different ways. So that might be by making strategic connections um, writing letters of support for other funding bids and as I mentioned earlier I think there's a real opportunity because on a positive note um, funders are increasingly making climate a key priority for grants so actually developing your own community climate action plan could even help support your um, your organization or your community's ongoing resilience So just moving on then to give a little bit of the flavour of what we think that the sort of look and feel of those monthly workshop sessions are going to be. Um, 
So really sort of like friendly and supportive and collaborative ethos. We've developed those ways of working document for the project. So we'll be using that to kind of um, develop our, how we work and how we interact with one another. We have these focused sessions with experts on the different climate themes and then focused sessions with community experts that will be sharing their insights, sharing how they did effective community engagement on the different themes. There'll be space for Q&A sessions, space for hints and tips from the Wave One partners. We'll be sharing relevant links um, to support and funding. And we'll also, um, that I, I'm not going to use the word homework, uh, but there'll be some optional suggested activities to help support the plan development and your community engagement in between. Little like quick snapshots, I said all of this is available on the website, but what is the information that we're asking um, from applicants? So there is um, a short-ish, uh, expression of interest form on the website and we've tried to keep it as concise as possible because we're really aware that this is it's all upfront time energy and capacity you have to put into doing this so there's a google form or there's a downloadable word form on the website um and it, it just asks you and it, it, it keeping it quite concise with not reams of information um just a bit about you your organization and your community about how you go about communicating and engaging with your community on a regular basis and how your organization represents the community that it serves um a little bit about why your motivations for why you'd like to get involved in the learning um, and mentoring program um, confirming that you have got a dedicated member of staff who could attend all of those workshop dates. And as I said, they're all planned out in advance. So that's a really, really important one. A little bit more information about how you would use the access bursary part to try and make your engagement more accessible to your community. And then if there's anything you want to share about any previous climate and nature experience. And as I said, that's not, that isn't a requirement. That's just the kind of contextual information for us. So hopefully that it's not too onerous um, to, to express your interest. In terms of the timeline, we've obviously got this information session today. The deadline for expressions of interest is the 20th of March. Um, and then the applications are going to be reviewed by a, a panel of project partners. And there is a clearly laid out uh, um, criteria within uh, application pack. So to be transparent, um, you'll know what it is that that panel will be looking at to, to make the decisions. Um, and then by the Easter holidays, by the 31st of March, we will notify all applicants of the outcome. And then over the period of the sort of Easter holidays and just beyond, there'll be a little bit of kind of online onboarding and sort of administration um, with the six new community organisations, a little bit of an induction. And then the first workshop session um, will be kicking off with um, kind of lots of lots of warm up and, and introductions and relationship building and that kind of thing on the 26th of April. Um, before we hear from another partner, I just wanted to make a little bit of a note about the strategic support that we have from Bristol City Council on this project, which has been absolutely essential to its success so far. And I think it's quite useful for prospective um, applicants for cohorts to just be aware of this. Um, so, you know, this is a very, very collaborative project and Bristol City Council is a core partner on the project. So Mark, who you heard from earlier, um, and colleagues in the Sustainable Cities and Climate Change team, they're involved in all aspects of the Community Climate Action Project. And they're really supportive of this um, community-led leadership around climate approach and the use of community climate action plans um, and how they can connect and, and kind of integrate into strategic planning and decision making that the council is doing um, on climate but on wider issues as well and Mark and colleagues have been great at sort of brokering and sort of enabling these strategic connections with the, the big beast that is the council organization so of, of getting specific climate um specialisms people within the council working on different things like transport or planning or those kinds of things to review draft plans and priorities um and and yeah and and, and acting as a kind of conduit to connecting community organizations with council leads around different things which is really useful really really invaluable but also there's a real, there's a kind of ethos and res of respect and trust and collaboration 
Um, and that means that they're, you know, the council representatives are able to be honest about the parameters and challenges and opportunities. You know, there are things that may come up as priorities that there are particular challenges around because of the way things work legally or the way funding is devolved from government or from the West of England Combined Authority. So there's just a, a real pragmatic um, kind of honesty about those kinds of things and, and trying to work together to find pragmatic solutions. Um, and there's some really good sort of strategic linking. So obviously the city has got its one city climate strategy, strategy and ecological emergency strategy, and it's got environment board um, and those kinds of things. So it's just trying to make sure the work of the community climate action projects and the plans coming through from communities are really kind of connected in with that top level um, governance around climate in the city. Um, and, you know, there's a, there is potentially a real advantage to the council as well, is that the plans themselves that are coming up from different communities can really help contribute to, to wider decision making or even larger scale funding bids um, and the sort of direction of decision making in the city. So they can provide really useful evidence of need uh, and priorities. So, yeah, I'm really, really good and grateful to have this positive and constructive relationship with Bristol City Council. So just, just useful for, for people to be aware, um, you know, that it, it is really important and they're really a critical part of the, the mix because we don't want to just be developing um, sort of community priorities in isolation. We need to be doing that in a, in a joined up way and that's worked really well so far. So that's enough from me um, on the process. Hopefully that's given you some information, but I'm sure there will be questions that you've got um, coming up. But before we move on to the Q&A session, just wanted to hear from another one of our current community partners, a little bit about what why they feel community-led climate action is important to them and the plan. So I would love to just quickly hand over to Maria from Lockley's Neighbourhood Trust. Thanks, Maria. Hi, thanks, Amy. Um, like I said in the chat, our object is really wild Lockley's, rewilding Lockleys with flowers and trees and it really is through all our conversations and our community activities where we actually talk and listen and respond we wanted our residents to prioritize what was important because often residents can feel overwhelmed disempowered um, guilty because of some of the choices they make um, they know most people do know about uh, climate action but they fail to recognize that they're actually taking action in some of the things they already do and that they could do a lot more. And one of our emphasis is it doesn't matter how you engage and whatever your contribution is collectively, we are pushing forward positive change. And the plan, one of the um, brilliant things about making a plan for your community is you suddenly start to um, recognize that you already got great networks that you're actually doing good stuff with people and there are things you can draw in and be available but our big focus is it's about pride of place about taking positive action and about the community shaping their community not just for them for future generations um so yeah we do a lot of a lot of <laughs> it doesn't have to be boring that's the other thing as well sometimes things can get technical and that can be off-putting for people. So we do fun activities that also have a massive benefit. If I take um, the um, community feast that we do, um, so that prevents food to go in, excess food go into landfill. It brings our communities together. We have fun. Um, we raise awareness about campaigns. We learn together, we connect, and that leads on to something else. Um, and, it, you know, we get about 175 people attend because who doesn't like to come and eat together, um, you know, and people, we did a quick little survey about meat free days and people were saying, oh, no, I'm not vegan or vegetarian. But when we picked that conversation apart and talked about breakfast and other meals, actually, the majority, well, of all the people I spoke to, everyone, at least half of the week, if we took 21 meals is a bit of an average. Everyone, half of their uh, weekly meals were meat free. So they're making an impact without even recognizing they're making an impact. So the community plan is really important about not just bringing your community together because lots of different residents were doing little things, 
but you need someone to like the focus, the, the magnet to bring people together. Um, and it really does strengthen your community and your networks with other organizations. It really does have a powerful impact on your community. Thank you, Amy. Oh, great. Wise words as ever. Thank you, Maria. Um, we haven't got time to hear from all of our um, phase one community partners, but we wanted to just give you a couple of other snippets. So we're just going to quickly show you a couple of box pops from Emma from Bristol Disability Equalities Forum and uh, Emily from Eastside Community Trust, just so that you could hear um, a few more little sort of perspectives and insights from community partners. So Clara's just going to get those up now. Community-led climate action is so important because it allows the people who are most impacted by climate change to be leaders in the area. Uh, the community of disabled people have been excluded from climate action for so long, which is terrible because we're not only one of the groups that are most impacted by the climate crisis, but by climate plans that are ill thought through. I'm really excited that our team will be growing so that we can do even more in the city um, and really start getting out there and supporting disabled people to take part in a better future. Just getting Emily up now. It's a good moment for you to formulate any questions that you might have for the Q&A session. Community-led climate action is really important, I think, because as we all start to wake up and realize how urgent the action is that we need to take to address the climate emergency, we need to make sure that we also involve communities from the start so people aren't left behind. I think we have an opportunity to take a really holistic approach that looks at physical health and mental health and making sure people's home finances are in order. And also things like changing the way that we work together and how we connect to each other in our community. And these are the opportunities of community-led climate action if we really take advantage of this opportunity now. I'm really excited to finally have the chance to put our community plan into action and try out the things that we've come up with with local residents and community leaders, um, trying things out, seeing what works and things that we can share more widely to take really big action. I'm also really excited about the people that we'll be working with. We'll be working with residents and community leaders and different faith groups in our local community, as well as the citywide partners and Bristol Energy Network. So just a wealth of experiences and expertise to come together and really do something quite big, I think. Great, thanks Emma and Emily. And there's more Vox Pops um, on, the, on the links that we'll be sharing on the Community Climate Action YouTube playlist. Um, so now we've got, we've obviously shared lots of information with you and hopefully that's answered some of your questions, but I'm sure there are lots more um, questions that you might have. I think one of the things to say is um, a lot of the, the work that we're doing is quite new. So we've obviously developed a, an approach in Bristol with the, the first phase, but in terms of this um, more focused learning participate, learning mentoring program, um, it's new. So we've, we've tried to think through as much as possible and, and what the answers are but um, it might be that you um, yeah you raise questions that we haven't yet identified in which case that would be really useful um, for us so I would just like to take the opportunity now to open it up to you um, if you are welcome to ask questions of any of the current community and project partners that we introduced at the beginning because you might have something specific for a particular community or the council um, so if anyone would like to put their hand up um, to do that, you can do that. And also if I can ask maybe Clara to check and see whether there's, I know there's been lots of activity going on in the chat. There might be some questions, some questions have been answered and thank you for the partners who've been responding. Um, but there might be some other questions that haven't yet been answered. Um, so Greg, you're straight in there, over to you. Yeah, right. Thank you, Amy. I think it's fantastic what the different uh, groups have achieved, and I'm really pleased that uh, the whole project has got more funding now. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on a question that I saw in the chat, really, because the area I live in is 
more affluent. You know, we, we have the highest recycling rates and yet we have the highest consumption rates. So the obvious vehicle in this area would be the community association. So would you still encourage us to apply for the, for the learning and mentoring program or would you kind of say, we'll just put it on hold for the moment and see who else applies? Um, that's a really good question, Greg, and thank you for, for raising it because it's something we've been thinking about. I think it's fair to say um, because of maybe the, some of the, the, the priorities from the lottery and from the, the, the kind of the foundations of the project in the beginning, there is a there is a prioritisation towards um, communities experiencing um, disadvantage and barriers. However, that, that's, that doesn't exclude any other communities as well. And as you've made the point that uh, some of the more affluent communities in the city have got the biggest carbon footprints and so the, potentially the biggest impact to be made and there's um there's real benefits that i think of bringing different different types of communities together for kind of exchange and learning so i wouldn't discourage you from applying but um or organizational communities that you represent um because it, it's certainly not close to that but but also being honest about the fact that there, there is a prioritization um to, towards southern communities. So I hope that helps. Um, and I'll go to Sarah. Hi, hi, I'm um, I'm based in um, Hillfields in East Bristol. And um, we're also thinking about uh, applying for the partnership, but because we have no staff, we're entirely led by volunteers. Um, I get a little bit of our uh, self-employed funding to pay for me but we essentially don't really pay anybody else and I've got kind of two questions based on that the first one being that we've already as a very small collective that have come together you know based on this fantastic initiative um have already identified that we don't have one single person that we can send to all of the meetings um we could be a bit consistent by only sending like two or three but we don't think we could just have one person. I wanted to know, obviously, if we share knowledge, would that be a barrier for us? Um, and the second one was, um, I saw that the the timeline is, you're thinking about you know, launching something in about a year's time. Is the is the idea behind this then that the, the focused work would take place over, over a year and that at the end of it, you would have, you know, seal of approval, here's your... Uh, you know, old shining new community climate action plan. But then I wondered because you still have lottery support until 2025. So is that the second vote? That's a big question. So sorry. That's a really good question, Sarah. And um, and please, other partners, do jump in. I'm going to respond with as as, as much as I know, but you, you might want to um, to kind of feed in. So, in terms of uh, the your the first part of your question about whether it needs to sort of be one consistent person all the way through, no, it doesn't. I think the point that we are making is that there needs to be a representative from your organization that is that can come to all of those dates because um there'd, there'd be a real it would be really challenging they're really sort of core dates if there was a core team of people um who were coming and they were different people but you were sharing I, that that's not necessarily um a barrier at all and we completely understand that for for smaller and more voluntary led organizations that that's the reality so we, we wouldn't want that to be a barrier it's just more about committing that that somebody from that organization is going to be present in all of those sessions and then going back and um sharing it and in in response to the second part of your question um yes we're sort of designing it so that the workshops and the mentoring process is, to, is sort of like taking place over about approximately a nine month period so there's a little bit of time at the end for you to kind of pull everything together and produce your plan and then um kind of launch it with some comms and so yes that for it, it's this um second cohort that is sort of it would be running from sort of april to to this time next year and then because it's the third cohort that would be so this time next year we'll be recruiting for another lot so um but i think the thing to say is though you know you each of the cohort two communities will be part of this 
much wider project. There's opportunities to get involved um, in other things like the community leadership panel. All the time there's other funding opportunities coming in. So you'd be sort of integrated into, um, into the project as a whole. So it wouldn't stop um, with the in, in terms of the involvement and connection with the production of your plans. Um, is there anyone else from, from the, the sort of CCA project team that wants to come in on any of that? Maria. I'll just point out that, um, oh, I don't know who it was, I think from Hillfields, uh, myself and our CEO share some of the meetings only because we're all part time. So it does work as long as your core team are effective at communication and understanding what's required. Um, so that works. And for the Greg, when you said about um, you're in a more affluent area, I would really look at is there a neighbouring area that you could actually, I don't know if it's uh, feasible, Amy, for people to do a co-joined plan because it affects everybody. We're all neighbours, um, you know, so it, and really that's one of the biggest things that I like. We used to work in, in boundaries and postcodes, but really this crosses all of that. This really is bigger than our postcode area. So I think, look at who your neighbors are, talk to your existing community partners. Also, this might be a way to strengthen and build a new relationship and go forward. Um, I hope that helps. That's great, thanks Maria. And, and I think the other thing to say just on the, the, the kind of more volunteer led organisations is, is just to acknowledge within all of the, the work that's been done so far, there have been, there has been quite a lot of volunteers involved in the engagement and the delivery and various different things. So although um, there has been paid time for the community organisations, they have each of them has has levered and sort of utilised a lot of volunteer capacity in, in, at, at various different points as well. Um, Ella, you've patiently had your hand up, so we go over to you. Hi, can you hear me? Great, new pair of headphones, I wasn't sure if they are going to work. Um, I was, um, obviously with the sessions, that kind of capacity is built in there, but I was wondering about hearing from some of the organisations about the actual commitment of what the engagement took. Like, you obviously want to do as much as possible to make sure you're representing your community as much as possible, but that could be very intensive and stuff, so I just wondered if anyone could give me some guidance on kind of how many events they ran or how long it went on for and how well that worked. Good question. Amy, I don't mind saying something about that. Um, Can so, I, yeah, sorry, Donna. Donna, I'm just, before you do that, sorry to cut in, I think it, I should, it's probably fair for us to say, uh, just to acknowledge before you share in a bit more detail, that um, there is there is a variance in in the kind of capacity and the budget that wave one organizations had because they were sort of developing the approach um and the learning and mentoring program is a more slim down efficient thing where you might be bringing in some of your own match funding that kind of thing so i just wanted to put that in as a caveat because i didn't want i, I know that partners are going to share the brilliant stuff that they've did and i don't want that to be sort of like overwhelming or for people to feel that's realistic with the the, the budget that's available uh, from us over to you, Donna, sorry. Yeah, no, I was going to put another caveat in there just to say that we did our engagement over COVID. Um, so we had to, uh, when we were planning this, we had all of these great plans about what we were going to do. And then we all went into lockdown and then there was restrictions. So we had to do our engagement over a much longer period. Um, some of it was online um, and anything that we did, we were limited, you know, only groups of 12. So we had to run things several times. So in, in all honesty, it would be difficult to kind of judge how much engagement you would need to do because we had to do much more because of the COVID restrictions, really. Maria. And I would just say as well, it's bearing in mind, you know, your own capacity. Um, you also know your neighbourhood, so you know how to communicate with them. So whether that's a, a, a survey or a newsletter, um, certainly I don't think, uh, you know, we've all done different things because we, we, we're all different projects. But um, it's about getting everyone involved. It has to be resident-led. It has to make sure that everyone can feed into whatever your plan uh, wants to do. Um, 
but it's about your capacity and being realistic. Don't come up with a plan where you're going to do this that, and the other, and there's no way you can deliver it. It's um, it's a realistic plan, and it's a plan where you you won't be working on your own. There will be other organisations, community partners, but obviously resident involvement. So. Um, it wouldn't just be you, but I would bear in mind your own capacity and how you communicate with your residents and wider groups. Thanks, Maria. And I guess just on, I'll come to, come to you, Emily, on, on that point, most of you presumably are working and talking with your community regularly anyway and holding community conversations or kind of like family days or, or things around housing advice or whatever. So it's very easy just to integrate kind of engagement around climate into the, the existing kind of programming and events that you're doing so that might be, you know, the kind of staff and, 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 and stuff is already funded. So just being a bit clever, a bit stealth about um, being efficient about that. Um, Emily. I think it is, it is, it is a big undertaking, but I think to what Maria said, it's not a single organization, a single person. I think it is really important to work with partners. Um, and I think kind of in response to Anna's question in the chat, as well as some of the other discussions we've been having, we're based in Eastern Lawrence Hill and there's quite a diversity of people living there at this point. Some who are very, who are much more affluent and much more involved in decision-making around climate and some who have just felt completely excluded from it. So some of what we did was a lot more targeted, making sure that some new voices were brought into the conversation that otherwise wouldn't be feeding into decisions around climate action. So there's there's lots of strategic ways to go about. I think Christina you know, focusing on young people, that was another decision that was made because you do have limited capacity and it's a huge, huge topic, huge topics. So um, I think there are a lot of ways to kind of think through how to go about doing it. There's not a single answer, I don't think, and you know your community. So just keep that in mind as you do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. And I see that there's a, a question in the chat about which geographic areas are already covered. So um, we, we can send that out. And it's East and Lawrence Hill, the kind of like Hartcliffe and Withywood, Lockleys and Lawrence Western areas. But we can do a follow up um, actually sort of defining those on the map. Um, I, did, I was wondering whether Emma from BDF was going to um, chip in, but um, just thinking about some of the engagement that they did. Um, and I suppose just making the point that it doesn't have to be sort of fancy bells and whistles. So Emma took a, a sofa basically and tea and coffee and went around because obviously the disabled community lives across Bristol. It's important to go where where people are already. So where groups of disabled people were coming together for activities and just rocking up and, and being there with tea and cake and a sofa and just starting those conversations. So it doesn't have it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm just looking at time and I'm thinking, I think we're probably going to have to wrap it up there in terms of questions. Um, some really good questions. Thank you. And hopefully some of the answers have, have clarified a few more things. And um, if you have got any more questions, pop them in the chat and we can follow up. Um, but I just wanted to sort of wrap up um, in terms of sort of like immediate next step. So thank you all for your questions and thank you to everyone who um, has shared responses to those. Um, I'll just get the uh, last slide up. Um, so yeah, just a quick summary then. So I'm hoping that we haven't put you off and there's quite a few of you in the room who would be really interested um, in putting in an expression of interest for the learning and mentoring program. So just a little bit of a recap um, on if that is the case, what next and how do you go about replying? So there's, we've talked about sort of headline information, but there's lots of thorough um, stuff in the application guidance and the pack that is on the Bristol Green Capital website and the link is on the chat. You can follow uh, the bit.ly link in the bottom right corner there to find all of that. I would encourage, yeah, double checking staff availability um, for those scheduled workshop dates. So the dates are all in there. That's kind of really important. Um, so then either complete the Google or the, the word form expression of interest and get that over to us by the 20th of March. Um, if you have got any other 
queries, so questions that haven't been answered by the session today, do just drop us a line on that email address there. And if you can put the Learning and Mentoring Programme in the email header, that will um, help us because we have a very uh, busy inbox. Um, so yeah, we're really, really, really hoping um, that some of you are encouraged to um, apply. Um, we look forward to receiving applications. Um, so I just wanted to end by saying thank you uh, to all of you for joining us this morning. I know you're all very busy and I know it's all, you know, time out of other, uh, other commitments and priorities. Um, and to end, and, and I suppose this speaks a little bit to different ways of engaging communities. You heard Kirsty talk about um, working with artists and with young people, and that's something that's been quite key in the engagement of that project as a whole. So we there were, we had two creative commissions working across all of the community partners in phase one. And obviously there's a really thriving um, creative sector within the city of Bristol. So it's a, a really good thing to utilize. And I guess using creativity and working with artists and creatives can be a great great way of opening up new and different conversations um, with, you know, in different ways with different people. So we thought um, to, yeah, as a nod to that, that it would be nice if we wrapped up today by showing you an example of one of those. So we're going to show you in just a minute um, some climate memes uh, digital shareable content that was made by local artists Morgan and Tommy in collaboration with um, the community partners. So um, we will, I'm just gonna stop sharing there. Thank you all very much for coming. Hope you're feeling a little bit inspired around um, community-led climate action. We will be, we obviously recorded this session. We will be sharing the recording and the slide deck um, on our website and in the follow-up email to you all. Um, and yeah, it's lovely to see you and thank you. Have a good day. Happy uh, St. David's Day to you all. And um, we will lead out and, and say goodbye with the climate memes. Thank you. That was amazing. You're on mute, Amy. A nice thing to end on. So thank you very much all for attending. Thank you to all our community partners um, for contributing and do get in touch if you've got any more questions. And uh, yeah, hopefully we look forward to uh, receiving expressions of interest. And, and if you feel also if it's not something that's right for you, but it might be for um, partners or collaborators in other communities, please do um, share the word. We're gonna be doing lots of comms over the next couple of weeks. So we're really keen to get the word out as widely as possible across the city. So thanks very much, everyone.